The documentary film you are about to see was shown to Mr. Alexander Kerensky, president of the Democratic Provisional Government of Russia, overthrown by the Communists in 1917. Mr. Kerensky consented to make a few introductory remarks about our picture. We present 80-year-old Alexander Kerensky in his New York City apartment on October 10th, 1962. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes you will see the documentary movie of the development of communistic movement throughout the world. The majority of this uh, audience is too young to remember that this communistic movement began in 1917 during the first war in my country, in Russia. I was uh, in this time leader of this provisional government of Russia. When uh, you look this film, keep in your mind that uh, Russian people were the first victim of the communistic tyranny. I think that is now uh, is time to study the communistic movement and to understand it, not by different uh, legend created during these long years, but by the documentary sources, as for instance this film. communism of our time, developed the theories of Karl Marx, and charted a course for communist revolutionaries the world over to follow. One of the principles laid down by Lenin was his concept of coexistence. The communist republic, Lenin instructed, can exist, of course not for a long time, in a capitalist surrounding. As soon as we are strong enough to defeat capitalism as a whole, we shall immediately take it by the scruff of the neck." Close quote. Nikita Khrushchev, currently leader of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, declares, quote, The foreign policy of the Soviet state from the very day of its birth has always been, and will be, Lenin's policy of peaceful coexistence. Close quote. Khrushchev has been trying to convince the free world that Lenin's policy of coexistence is a peaceful one, that war is no longer inevitable, and that peaceful competition exists between communist and free states. We present our documentary film, which shows the development of communism in the image of its leaders, and what the communists mean by coexistence. 1917. Vladimir Lenin is in exile in Switzerland. In Petrograd, Russia, Alexander Kerensky, who directed the revolt against the tyrannical regime of Tsar Nicholas II, leads a democratic provisional government. German Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg, hoping to get Russia out of the war, spirits Lenin across Germany in a sealed freight car. In Petrograd, Lenin agitates against the provisional government, promising the masses a dictatorship of their own, a dictatorship of the proletariat. On November 7th, October 25th by the old Russian calendar, troops of the demoralized army and navy under the direction of number two Bolshevik, Leon Trotsky, seize the Winter Palace, the government headquarters, and destroy the assembly. Lenin now controls all of Russia. Bolsheviks soon change their name to communists. Lenin immediately creates a terrible weapon against counter-revolution, secret police battalions and builds a new war machine under Commissar of War, Leon Trotsky, shown here reviewing the troops. The dictatorship of the proletariat, the laboring class, promised by Lenin, is a myth. 
In reality, the dictatorship is that of a privileged new class, the Communist Party, its ruling clique, and particularly that of its chairman. Lenin's coexistence policy is revealed. Communism side by side with capitalism for a long time is unthinkable. One or the other must triumph in the end. And before that end comes, a series of frightful collisions between the Soviet Union and capitalist states will be inevitable. In 1922, Lenin suffers a stroke. Front on this podium are Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev, exercising power for Lenin. In the back is Joseph Stalin, the new general secretary of the party's central committee, and at this time still relatively unknown. January 24th, 1924, Vladimir Lenin dies. A sordid struggle for power begins. Stalin forms a collective leadership with Zinoviev and Kamenev scheming to destroy the image of Trotsky as Lenin's successor. Using his position as party secretary, Stalin staffs key posts with his followers and takes control of the secret police and army. Stalin proceeds to split and wreck the collective leadership. His competition, Trotsky, here with his wife and son, is exiled. Stalin informs the masses, the dictatorship of the proletariat is in essence the dictatorship of its communist party. The opposition, these independent farmers, religious leaders, and inconvenient minorities, are forced to dig the Volga Don Canal. Slavery becomes an essential part of the communist economy. Slave labor camps are set up all over the Soviet Union. 125 camps, 10 million slaves on their backs. Stalin builds an industrial Russia geared for conflict with the West. An image of Stalin as a demigod is created, and a new communist culture comes into being. Artists and artisans find communist fame and fortune glorifying Stalin. Stalin becomes a man of the people, the source of all goodness, all wisdom, all love. Stalin is now pictured as Lenin's closest associate. The revolution's greatest general, communism's most profound thinker, the great educator. This communist narrator says, Operators, lorry drivers, hydro mechanizers and others, are studying the economic laws discovered and substantiated by Stalin, Stalin is pictured as the guardian of the hearth and home, a hero for children to worship. He is very much aware of one of communism's primary objectives, to capture the minds and hearts of the young. He gives great attention to the Komsomol, the Young Communist League, whose aim is to link every step in the training and education of the youth toward victory in the class struggle. A world under communism. Family ties are discouraged. The state is supreme. Translation, religion is the opiate of the people. Religious satires are staged throughout the Soviet Union. Atheism continues to be the official state doctrine since Lenin's time. Communism instructs, never forget the clergy are the greatest enemies of the Soviet state. Indoctrinators are guided by Lenin's instruction. Children must be taught to hate their parents if these are not communists. Students preparing to teach find that 40% of their coursework is made up of subjects promoting communist doctrine. And while the peaceful coexistence theme is sold abroad, at home the organ of Soviet writers defend Soviet policy not to abandon the war theme. We must write of war so that the generation of young people which comes after us can love arms and be ready for struggles and victories. Stalin claims the Soviet Union must develop its military might because it fears attack from the West. However, the Communist International reveals wars for the emancipation of the world from capitalism will necessarily and inevitably arise. It goes on with an excellent example of double talk. There is a glaring contradiction between the imperialists' policy of piling up armaments and their hypocritical talk about peace. 
There is no such contradiction, however, between the Soviet government's preparations for defense and for revolutionary war and a consistent peace policy. Revolutionary war of the communist dictatorship is but a continuation of revolutionary peace policy by other means. 1933, Stalin emphasizes his peaceful coexistence program to get diplomatic recognition from the United States. At home, Stalin plots to get rid of his opposition. He confides to his friends to choose the victim, to prepare the blow with care, to satisfy an implacable vengeance and then go to bed. There is nothing sweeter in the world. On the right is Sergei Kirov. Stalin uses the assassination of Kirov as the excuse for the executions that claim thousands of lives. The first to go, Stalin's former associates, Zinoviev, executed, Kamenev, executed, Radek, executed, Piotrkov, executed. Leon Trotsky comments from Mexico. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention or execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and Radek Petakov. What is now my principal task? To reveal the truth, to show and to demons demonstrate that the true criminals hide under the cloak of the accusers. What will be the next step in this direction? The creation of an American and European and subsequent also an international commission of inquiry, composed of people who incontestably enjoy authority and... Trotsky's future, assassination. Back in Moscow, the cream of the officer corps, condemned without witnesses or defense, is shot within 48 hours. Literary giant Maxim Gorky dies under mysterious circumstances. One of those benefiting most from the assassinations is Stalin's new protege, Nikita Khrushchev, now first secretary of the Moscow Party organization. Khrushchev acclaims Stalin, Hail the greatest genius of mankind, who leads us victoriously to communism, our own Stalin. Molotov, Mikoyan, and Kaganovich also approve. By 1939, in America, through the tactic of united and popular front organizations, Stalin controls the activities of communists and their sympathizers everywhere. Communists maneuver their way into the French government. In Yenin, China, another Stalin protege, guerrilla leader Mao Zedong, takes advantage of his coexistence with President Chiang Kai-shek to firmly establish himself in the North waiting to take over the whole country. In the Ukraine, Khrushchev, Stalin's troubleshooter, becomes the new secretary of its Communist Party. In Moscow, instead of the withering away of the state promised by Karl Marx, the Communist dictatorship has become a monster, dependent for its power on the secret police and Red Army. Stalin waits for the chance to spill Communist forces over the borders of the Soviet Union. World War II gives Stalin his chance. First with Hitler, and then with the Allies. With the close of the Second World War, Stalin steps up his campaign for closer coexistence with the West. However, the Communist International reminds its agents, the disarmament policy of the Soviet government must be utilized for purposes of agitation in support of the only way toward disarmament and abolition of war, arming the communists, overthrowing the capitalists, and establishing the communist dictatorship. While the coexistence theme is played throughout the world, Red Army troops and security police in East Europe aids local trained in Moscow agents to capture key posts in newly created coalition governments. Soon, East Europe falls to the Reds. In the Presidium are leaders of the party and government, representatives of the various Soviet republics, and of the Communist and Workers' Parties abroad. December 2nd, 1949, at the peak of his power, Stalin celebrates his 70th birthday. Khrushchev joins in the deification of his leader. Stalin, he proclaims, genius, leader, teacher, father of the nationalities, great industrializer, great collectivizer, creator of Soviet culture, careful gardener, tenderly rearing the human beings in his charge. President of the Supreme Soviet, Nikolai Svernik, makes the introductory speech. 
To his left are Georgie Malenkov, first secretary of the Central Committee, and Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's Minister of Interior and State Security. Next to Stalin are Mao Zedong, Walter Ulbricht, Deputy Prime Minister of East Germany, and in a place of prominence, Nikita Khrushchev. To further lull and psychologically disarm the West, Stalin steps up the clamor for peace throughout the world. A rash of peace demonstrations breaks out. This is one of them. The communist narrator says, The German youth is greeted by the delegates to the World Youth Festival representing 101 countries. Among those marching are 35,000 young peace champions from Western Germany who managed to get through Adenauer's police court. Two million persons take part in the procession. In the evening, there's a youth meeting on the square. The speech of greeting is made by Walter Ulbricht, Deputy Prime Minister of the German Democratic Republic. Nineteen fifty two. There is no peace in the Kremlin as Stalin again prepares to assassinate dissident elements in the party. This time he plans to include his entire inner circle. Molotov, Malenkov, Beria, Mikoyan, and thousands of others are threatened. Khrushchev is an ardent Stalin supporter. Long live the wise leader of the party and the people, he proclaims. The inspirer and organizer of all of our victories, Comrade Stalin. Before the murders can begin, the end of a tyrant. At the beer, the beginnings of a struggle for power reminiscent of the aftermath of Lenin's death. Again, a collective leadership takes over. Molotov, Beria, and Malenkov, who becomes premier. Khrushchev waits in the background. The East Berlin uprising against the communist dictatorship gives Khrushchev an opportunity to split the triumvirate. Khrushchev says it has now been established that this villain, Beria, had climbed up the government ladder over an untold number of corpses. Among other charges, Beria is accused of treason by his failure to foresee the uprising, and he is executed. Khrushchev takes Beria's place in the collective leadership and uses his position as secretary general of the party, as Stalin did, to staff key posts with his followers. Premier Malenkov, on Khrushchev's right, is disgraced and forced to resign. Malenkov's successor, Nikolai Bulganin, shown here with Marshal Zhukov, is a Khrushchev puppet, and Khrushchev is soon to succeed him. Molotov is banished. Then, in a maneuver that astounds the world, apparently to obscure the role he played as Stalin's protege, Khrushchev seeks to destroy the overpowering image of his former mentor. February 25, 1956. This is the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev is delivering his secret de-Stalinization speech. Comrades, he says, the cult of the individual acquired such monstrous size because Stalin himself supported the glorification of his own person. Was it without his knowledge that Stalin monuments were erected throughout the country? these memorials to the living. And when Stalin asserts that he himself wrote the short course of the history of the All-Union Communist Party, the work created by a group into a book written by Stalin, this calls for at least amazement. His short biography is an expression of the most dissolute flattery. We need not give here examples of the loathsome adulation filling this book. They were all approved and edited by Stalin personally. Khrushchev continues, Stalin knew the country and agriculture only from films that dressed up and beautified the existing situation, and so pictured collective farm life that the tables were bending from the weight of turkey and geese. Evidently, Stalin believed it was so. The power in the hands of Stalin led to serious consequences during the war. To his leadership were dedicated many literary works and paintings full of fantasy. When we look at many of our novels, films, and historical scientific studies, they make us feel sick. And then Khrushchev concludes, we cannot let this matter get out of the party, especially not to the press. It is for this reason that we are considering it here at a closed session. In October 1956, Khrushchev, waving the banner of peaceful coexistence, brutally extinguishes Hungary's bid for freedom. 
Khrushchev, who earlier established himself as a man of the people, begins to build a new image. He becomes a great educator, especially interested in the young people. These third grade students are being sworn into the communist young pioneer organization. The children take the oath in answer to the question, quote, are you prepared to give us your entire strength to work toward the noble goal of communism? Khrushchev becomes a man of the world, interested in people and problems everywhere. He meets with Sukarno of Indonesia, with Mao Zedong and Fidel Castro. Khrushchev organizes movements for the abolition of atomic weapons. He hammers away at the United Nations, demanding coexistence on his own terms. The world has an opportunity to learn that Khrushchev's brand of communism is in the same tradition as Lenin's and Stalin's. He breaks a solemn agreement for no further testing and resumes some 40 nuclear explosions, detonating a multi-megaton hydrogen bomb, apparently to frighten the world. Preaching disarmament, he maintains the largest standing army on earth, a constant threat to peace, an ever-present instrument of blackmail. Says his minister of war, Rodion Malinovsky, Glory to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which has inspired and organized all our victories. Working for world peace, the Soviet state shows its ceaseless concern for the army, which has been called upon... It appears that Khrushchev is following Lenin's advice. Every peace program is a deception of the people and an hypocrisy, unless its principal object is to explain, support, aid and develop the revolutionary struggle. He continues to exert pressure all over the world. Khrushchev says, hands off revolutionary Cuba, where a brutal dictatorship under longtime communist Fidel Castro imposes the yoke of Marxism-Leninism on the Cubans and serves to export communism to Central and South American countries. Khrushchev awards Castro the Lenin Peace Prize. Khrushchev has been trying to persuade the free world that there has been a basic change in communist ideology. Yet he predicts a world under communism in his time and continues to support Marxist-Leninist dogma. He says, if anyone believes that our smiles involve abandonment of the teachings of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, he deceives himself fully. Those who wait for that must wait until the shrimp learns to whistle. From the text of the Soviet Party's draft program to the 22nd Congress, October 1961, as presented by Nikita Khrushchev, come the following quotations. The tried and tested Marxist-Leninist principles of communist internationalism will continue to be inviolable principles which the party will follow undeviatingly. The peaceful coexistence of states with different social systems does not imply discontinuance of the ideological struggle. Peaceful coexistence affords more favorable opportunities for the struggle in capitalist countries. The success of the struggle for the victory of the revolution will depend on how well the working class and its party master the use of all forms of struggle, peaceful and non-peaceful, parliamentary and extra-parliamentary and how well they are prepared to replace one form of struggle by another, and how quickly they may do it, and how unexpectedly. The communist parties are the vanguard of the world revolutionary movement. They have demonstrated the vitality of Marxism-Leninism, and their ability not only to propagate the great ideals of scientific communism, but also to put them into practice. With more than 37% of the world's people in the communist orbit by 1963, the communists continued to subscribe to Lenin's doctrines, convinced that Lenin's techniques which they have followed pay handsome dividends. Coexistence is the keystone to the success of Lenin's deliberate and predictable program for world communism. The communists want to avoid total military involvement while a warfare that is unconventional proceeds by unorthodox, irregular, and indirect means. When Khrushchev threatened the Western Hemisphere by stealthily setting up offensive missile bases in Cuba in November 1962, 
He did so while the Kremlin propaganda apparatus around the world was promoting their peaceful coexistence theme. Any move to dismantle the bases was made only after the United States had deployed vast military might in the Caribbean to reinforce our demand that the missiles be removed. Communist pressures continue to be exerted around the borders of the free world. This chart shows the historic strategy shifts in the communist coexistence policy since 1918. First, militancy. Then, conciliation. The hard line. The soft line. Repeatedly to the present. But what of the future? As long as these pressures exist, the best we can hope for is an uneasy truce between the communist and non-communist world rather than any condition for genuine peace. The hope of the free world for real peace continues to depend upon a knowledge of communist methods, upon our own alertness, and upon avoiding the tendency to read too much into tactical changes in the party line. Communism and coexistence is presented in the hope that it will contribute to a better understanding of this problem which is faced by all free men.